Hey, here we are again. I am so glad you're here. I'm thrilled you're here, as a matter of fact. I'm thrilled you're here. Today, uh, we're going to be continuing in Romans. We're going to be in chapter 6, if you want to start finding that in your Bible. So we've been doing this all year, going through the book of Romans, and we're in and we're back out, in and back out, in and back out. Uh, kind of the pattern that we're going to be in. And I feel like um, usually I'm a little more scheduled than this, but as I'm working through this book, I'm realizing that I have to be a lot more flexible with my schedule. <laughs> um, and today I'll give you a little, a little look into why I say that. But I think we're going to be in this section of Romans now till probably the end of June, beginning of July. Um, that's kind of my goal right now. And so how many of you in the, in the top of, of your Bible, in Romans chapter 6, have a heading that says something like, dead to sin, alive to God, something along those lines. Most everybody, something along those lines, or the believer is dead to sin, or sin's power removed, things like that, right? So the idea is, this chapter, he's in this first section, he's talking about being dead to sin and alive to God. Now I'm going to give you a little look behind the curtain into my, my brain as I start to work through these sections of Scripture. There's just too much for me to cover in one message about being dead to sin and being alive to God. I just felt like there was too much there, okay? So what we're going to do is I'm going to break that in, in half, and so we're going to do the dead to sin part today, and then we're going to do the alive to God part next week. Sound good? Good? Okay. That's good. That's just too much. I don't want to push through stuff just in the interest of of covering it. So I want to slow down a little bit and we'll talk about dead to sin today and alive to God next week. So Paul's goal in this section is helping us to see that we're dead to the sinful way in which we lived before we knew Jesus. That's the idea. And it helps us to understand the kind of an important concept here that our salvation is not married as you were, to our sanctification, okay? And Paul is using this to focus, he's focusing on this idea that how our guilt is removed at salvation, okay? And then as we're dead to sin, the penalty is paid, and then we become alive to God. And in that, we begin the, the sanctification process. And what he's talking about, basically, is discipleship. He's talking about becoming a disciple of Jesus. That's the idea. So I'm just kind of framing it this way. It helps me when I write sentences like this to, to stay on task when I'm trying to put a message together. So the, the idea that I got for this is that we can all grow in our sanctification when we see three characteristics of living in victory over sin. Okay, So we're going to look at these three characteristics. So with that, let me pray, and then we'll jump in here. Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much for today and for these people. Lord, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that through Christ, we have the ability to be dead to sin. That we can say that we're dead to sin is an amazing, amazing claim that we can make because of the shed blood of Jesus. So Lord, as we look at this today, I pray that you would open our eyes to your word. I pray that you would let your word penetrate our hearts. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would have free reign to do his work in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just read this section of scripture real quick. Uh, we're going to be chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died to sin has been set free from sin. That's the section we're going to look at today. So I want to just quick throw back to the first, like, probably about week three of this study, I was talking a lot about the circumstances of the church that Paul writes to in Rome, okay, if you remember that. And about them being a divided church and things like that, but I also said that 
Paul wrote this letter because he had already made three missionary journeys around in the Mediterranean Sea, and his goal was through this letter to send this as almost think of it like a missionary's introduction letter, okay? And his goal is to send this letter to the church in Rome and that he could use Rome as an anchor to send his missions farther west with a goal of going to Spain, okay? So that's part of the goal of him to write that. And what he did in this is he gives this very full explanation of the gospel. He gives a very detailed look into what the gospel is. And he wants to do this because he wants to tell the Roman church, this is what the gospel is, and this is what I plan to take to Spain using your area as an anchor. And in that gospel explanation, Paul really starts to hit on this idea that the gospel isn't just about us being forgiven and going to heaven. Okay, It's about us being forgiven and then experiencing the kingdom of God here as a now but not yet reality. Okay, you've heard me say that a few times now. And that the gospel will actually affect us here and now, and it will change things about us. So he's giving that church this full look at what the gospel really is and what his intentions are, what his gospel intentions are as he heads towards Spain. So I'm going to look at these three things, and, and as he's doing this, it would help us as readers today to understand what he's explaining in the gospel. So number one on your bulletin, if you're looking, at that, uh, you have, be dead. <clears throat> be dead. Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So Paul goes back to that form of diatribe that I talked about earlier in the letter where he's kind of anticipating some arguments or objections that people might be having as he's bringing this gospel message to them. And this idea is, He's anticipating that some of these people are saying, well, wait a minute, if we're just saved by faith, if, we don't need, if we're saved by grace through faith, if we don't need to do anything, can we just go on living like hell? That would be the idea. Can we just go on living like hell so God will be able to give us more grace? Right? God can really show off if I'm just living like hell and he gets to just keep dumping grace on me and I can say, hey, I got more grace than you. But I can still go to heaven. That's the idea. That's the objection that he's trying to, to target. And I feel like as we've looked at the way he's been approaching this, this isn't really an objection. And you'll know what I mean when I say this. This isn't the kind of objection where people probably wanted to be able to live like hell still. But what they're challenging is this idea of the simplicity of the gospel message that Paul is bringing to them. They're challenging the idea that I can't do anything to earn salvation. They're saying, well, if I'm just saved by grace through faith, I can just keep on sinning that grace may abound, right? And Paul comes at them as he anticipates this in a very Pauline way, right? By no means. By no means. The argument that people are leveling against him is an argument that we should anticipate if we're preaching the truth of the gospel message, if we are telling people that you can't earn it, that it's a free gift, if we're telling people that, we should anticipate this same objection. And if we're not getting that objection, we should look at to make sure, are we giving people the truth of the gospel? Are we letting them know that they can't earn salvation? And that it's not Jesus plus some good stuff or Jesus plus you picking yourself up by your spiritual bootstraps, okay? But the gospel message is that Jesus Christ did all of the work, right? And that your works come from your salvation, not for your salvation, okay? Some people struggle with that because it seems too simple. And I've said this before, and this is, a, this is something I want to really drill on here. We talk about this grace being a free gift. But what I don't want us to, to misunderstand is the difference between free and cheap. Okay, Because the gift was, is free, but it was not cheap. Okay, It cost God his only son. Right? So we have to remember that. And that's how we can help people understand that, to say, this gift is free for you, but it was paid for with a price. Okay? 
So here's where I'm going with this. Be dead, right? We got to get dead to sin. We got to get dead to sin. So when you hear that said, you may go along this train of thought, and there's some teaching out there that I think is potentially dangerous that would basically say, what can a dead guy do? He can't do anything, right? So when you're saved, you become dead to sin, you just stop sinning because you're dead to sin. That's pretty dangerous, isn't it? I think that's fairly dangerous. Let me ask you a question. Has that been your experience? When you were saved, if you're rendered dead to sin, did you just stop sinning? No. That's no that's none of our experience if we're being honest, is it? Okay. So that's why I want to point out that idea and that teaching, and I want to say it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Because that would be like saying that when we are dead to sin, that all of the temptations that were there are gone. That nothing would ever lead us in an area that we might sin and that we're not even susceptible to that. So if we, if we think that way, if we think, well, I'm dead to sin, so I no longer sin, period, because I'm dead to it, I think one of two things starts to happen. Our own experiences will tell us that that's not accurate. So if our experiences are telling us that that's not accurate, then we do one of two things. We'll start to doubt Scripture. Because if we read in Scripture that we're dead to sin, but we're still experiencing sin, well, then we'll say, well, maybe Scripture's not right about that. Or, which is obviously a, a bad way to go, <laughs> right? We don't want to start thinking that Scripture's wrong and we're right. But the other side of that coin, then, is we can start lying about our own experiences. Because we want to still hold that high view of Scripture and say, well, I'm not sinning. Because Scripture told me I'm dead to sin. And then when we talk to one another and, and somebody starts to share struggles with us, we go, well, I don't have that. I'm dead to sin. And then we start to have this ripple effect where then we lose this ability to share with one another. We start to get to the point where we don't want to be vulnerable. And then the enemy uses that and he can have us keep our sin in the dark. Because we know if we expose it that we're going to be met with this idea that, well, why are you sinning? I'm dead to sin. What's your problem? Maybe you're not, maybe you're not doing it right. Because I'm dead. I'm dead to sin. Does that make sense? It's important for us to realize that. So when he's talking about being dead to sin, Scripture tells us what he means. Okay? Death is represented in Scripture. I want to look at an example from the second chapter of the Bible and the second to last chapter of the Bible in it. Genesis 2.17 says this way, but, the, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat it, you will surely die. And then in Revelation 21.8 we see, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolatries, and liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Okay. So there's this concept all throughout Scripture that sin is, is linked with a penalty that is death. And that theme runs through Scripture. Okay? And this is what we talked about last week. Death came in through sin and spread to all humanity. And Jesus pays the penalty for sin, which is death. Does that make sense? Following that train? So this happens when he willingly goes to the cross in our place. Because it's our penalty, not his. Make sense? So this is what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died in that's how that logic flows through this, okay? So the focus of this is that we're dead to sin because the penalty is paid. That's how we're dead to sin. Jesus paid the penalty. We've been forgiven, and our own experience in life knows this, 
And Scripture confirms it, that after we're dead to sin, after that penalty is, has been paid, that we should not be continuing to live in a sinful lifestyle. Does that make sense? That he says we shouldn't live in it. And we don't go on in that sinful lifestyle because we feel like we're in a hole that's too deep to get out of. Right? We don't just say, I'm already so far in, I may as well just stay here. But it's this idea that that penalty has been paid. So in accepting that gift, we are submitting to that. We're submitting to the idea that the penalty has been paid, and then we allow the Holy Spirit to change us. And I've talked about this before, because our own experience will tell us we, we do continue to struggle with sin, even after salvation. But the idea is, as I've explained it before, and I realize now that I'm backwards for you guys, so I'm going to try to do it this way. If this is a graph over here, and this is where you were in your sin when you were saved, and this is where you are today, and this would be like holiness, our needle should be moving this way. Does that make sense? I did the graph backwards last time, and I apologize for that. Totally should have gone this way. I laid in bed thinking about it. So the penalty is paid, so why would it be part of our life? That's what he's getting at here. Why would that penalty be part of our lives if it's already been paid for? So we know that the temptations are still here. We experience that. And those same temptations, those same temptations were here when Jesus walked the earth. And Hebrew tells us that he experienced them, yet without sin. Okay? So I, again, like I said earlier, I, I like to try to tell stories to illustrate points. I had a, a chocolate lab. His name was Haas. Okay? Big dog. Cool looking dog. Big dog. I used to duck hunt all the time. Like all fall, whenever the season was open, I would duck hunt. I had a chocolate lab. And from the time I got him, when he was a puppy, he went everywhere that I went. It was like to the point where it was annoying to some of my friends. They're like, hey, you can't just keep bringing your dog here. You know, it was fine when he was a cute little thing, but now he's 90 pounds and it's kind of annoying, you know. But he went everywhere with me. I used to take him duck hunting, of course, and then when I'd go fishing out in the boat, I'd take him out in my boat. He used to stand up on the stand up in the bow on his front, you know, front paws on the bow and his ears would be flapping in the wind and he'd just be, he loved it, right? And then when we would, i I jump shot ducks, so we would sneak up on ducks. And he would get down on his belly, and as I was crawling, he would crawl like this and look at me. He was great. He was great. Eventually, I had to put him to sleep, right? That's what happens with dogs, right? So I had him cremated because they got me in a moment of weakness, you know, and they said, well, for an extra, you know, $2 million, we can cremate him, you know. <clears throat> I know I come off harsh sometimes with our pets, all right, but... It's, it's not from a place of a person who hasn't been there, okay? Because guess what happened after I got him cremated and, and stuff like that after a while? I'm thinking, I want to spend this money on that. And, you know, he's a great dog, but like, dog, you know. So I struggle with it later. But here's what I didn't do. Here's what I didn't do. You know, you get your dog back and, and he's in the black plastic box, right? Right? I get the dog back. I did not take the black plastic box duck hunting. Okay? I didn't put the black plastic box in my boat when I went fishing. Okay? There was a natural time the dog had died and I no longer played with him. Okay? I didn't take him out and do all the things that I used to do with him. Right? We, we recognize that. Jesus paid the penalty of sin. And in that payment, he renders us dead to sin. Dead to sin. Sin is still alive and well, in case you haven't noticed. Sin is still alive and well. But we, as followers of Christ, are dead to it. Does that make sense? So here's what we do with this. This is self-examination. Are you living in a way that understands that you're forgiven? Do you really understand that you're forgiven? And are you living as though the penalty for sin has been paid 
for your sin. Do you still drag around the sin that you're dead to? Do you still carry it around? Do you take it out and look at it from time to time? That's the question. That's the question that Paul would have the Roman church asking, and that's the question that we need to be asking. So after we're dead, we need to be buried. Okay? So number two on your notes is be buried. Romans 6, 3, and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So, last week I talked about original sin and I talked about how Paul did not write Romans chapter 5 to help us develop a doctrine of original sin. Okay, but that came later. So, bonus observation, Paul is going to talk about baptism. Okay? And he's talking about the water baptism of believers and, and we can have a sidebar discussion about why I think that's what he's talking about. This section of scripture isn't written to help us develop a th theology of baptism. Okay? But it's very interesting to me because Paul is talking as if it's just assumed that once you become a believer in Christ, you get baptized. It's just what you do. And we can look at lots of other scripture as to why he won't feel that way, right? And other teachings as why you might feel that way. But this is how we tell the world that we're following Jesus. Right? That's how we tell the world that we're following Jesus. It's how we, how we identify ourselves with him. And it's this outward display of an inward change that has happened to us. And Paul just says it like, how would you not be baptized if you're a believer, right? So it's that thing that demonstrates in the physical what happened in the spiritual when we come to faith in Christ. We die to sin and we're raised to life in Jesus. And that's what we're going to look at next week. Here's another little caveat. Paul is not here saying that it's faith plus baptism that saves. Okay? That's important too. Because he's just spent several chapters trying to make sure that everyone understands that we're justified by faith. Doesn't he? So now he's not bringing in this faith and another thing. So if you are a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized, come and talk to me afterwards because we'll get you dunked, okay? We'll dunk you. We got a sweet baptismal picture back on track. So be buried. Be buried. So Paul begins here with that symbolism of baptism, right? When we go into the water, we're symbolizing our death that he paid for, right? When he paid the penalty of sin. We go into the water, it symbolizes us being buried in order that we can raise, be raised with him. So this just like, there's nothing else to describe this. Think about a graveside service. Think about a graveside service. We've all been there. And you stand at the side of that grave, right? And you see the hole in the ground. Usually they've got it, you know, got the AstroTurf there to dress it up and make it look nice. But we know what this is. We know that it's a hole in the ground. And we know that there's a finality that comes, isn't there? When the casket is brought out of that coach and set on that rack. And we know that after we're all done saying our goodbyes to that person, that they're going into that hole in the ground. Right, And we know that if they don't know Jesus or if we don't, we're not going to see them again. There's a finality that comes in burial. There's a finality that comes in burial. But there's a huge difference that I want to point out here as we are dead to sin and we're buried. There's a huge difference between that graveside of a loved one because at the gravesite of a loved one, what do we do? We think about all the good times. 
We think about the hugs. We think about the great advice. We think about all the good things that that person and us share, right? But when we bury sin, we absolutely have to look at the whole picture. We have to look at the whole picture. And here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. When you're burying sin, don't just think about what you think of as maybe a highlight reel. Okay? Don't think of sin as a highlight reel. When you look back at your, your, your life before you were dead to sin, don't remember the party without remembering the hangover. Okay? And don't remember that party without remembering the regrets and the apologies afterwards that you had to make. Don't remember that great financial gain without remembering some corners that maybe you had to cut to get it. Don't remember all the, the great relationships and investments that you've made in people over the years without remembering compliments that you withheld, without remembering love that you withheld. That's critical. When we bury sin, we have to look at the whole picture. We have to remember all of it. So what does it look like to bury sin? If we're dead to it, what does it look like to bury it? I have a few things that I think are important. First, we have to identify it. Right? We have to identify it. So what is it in your life? What sin is in your life that you've been reckoned as dead to and now needs to be buried? What is it for you, yourself? Not for the person sitting next to you. Okay? What is it that needs that your sin that needs to be buried? So before you bury it, you have to know that it's dead. You have to know it's dead first. Okay? So identify that sin. Understand that you are dead to that sin. That Jesus paid the penalty for that sin too. And then you have to say goodbye. You have to say goodbye remembering the full picture. The full picture of sin. So what does that look like in a, the, whole, the holistic picture of that? It might mean ending a relationship that's causing you to sin. It might mean putting some healthy boundaries in place. Okay? It might mean not putting yourself in positions where you're likely to be tempted by that sin. But I, I, I want to be clear, too. The things I'm saying here are not self-help. Okay? This isn't Try harder to put boundaries in place. This isn't try harder to not be put in positions where you might be tempted. We are only able to do those things when we're in Christ. When we understand that it's Him who does those things to us. Okay? We don't have the power to do it. If we did, we already would have. But we don't. He's the one that gives us the ability to count ourselves as dead to that sin and alive to him. And that's what we're going to look at next week, being alive to Christ. Because without that union with Christ, we're still in Adam. We looked at that last week, and we're still in our sin. So don't ever hear this as self-help, because it's not. Okay? It's not. Number three, be raised. Be raised. Romans 6, 5 through 7, For if we have been crucified with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that the old self, that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. This is awesome. For one who has died has been set free from sin. This is good news. This is really good news. This is fantastic news. When we understand that we're dead to sin and we bury sin, and we know that the old us that loved our sin, because we loved our sin, 
Yeah, we did. That we will be united with him in the newness of life that Paul mentioned earlier in this scripture. That's my life verse or my whatever verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's fantastic news. <laughs> That's just fantastic news. That's what we celebrated at Easter, this idea of being raised, isn't it? That when Jesus dies and he's resurrected, he defeats death and he defeats sin. They're defeated. They lose. He wins. And we win in him. So we share that victory, the victory that Jesus secured. And Paul uses this powerful imagery to help the Roman church and to help us understand that idea. That in Jesus taking on the sin of the world, our old self is crucified with him. And that union with Christ that I just hit on, that's a theme that runs through scripture. We're referred to as the bride of Christ, the church is. And this is a picture of how we're united with him. So if we're dead to sin, we buried it, we're raised to life in him, we should be living that. We should be living like people who are dead to sin, who have buried it, and who have been raised to life in him. And that picture, Paul, he'll revisit, and that idea of chains being broken, being freed from bondage, right? And he's going to get into the slavery metaphor. And that slavery, slavery metaphor, sorry, would be very appropriate for that church that he's writing to. Very appropriate. So many people in that Roman church were slaves either by choice or not. Right? Slavery was was a part of that culture. But what they find out when they read Paul's letter is, and what we find out is that when they're in Christ, they're freed from the bondage and the penalty of sin. Which is amazing. And so are we today. We're freed from that bondage and that So I'm going to start. I'm going to start starting to end. How does that sound? This is the, the beginning of the end. So the application. How do we? What do we do with this? I think it's it's part of it is challenging yourself and asking yourself some hard questions. So how does your life look different? How does your life look different? Is the needle moving in the right direction? So a, a reminder in that, we know that sin is still very well alive. Maybe, maybe even thriving. Maybe we could say that sin is thriving. But we're dead to it entirely. So the question that we all ask ourselves, am I a new creation? Am I a new creation? Look again at verse 7. For one who has died has been set free from sin. That's a big deal. Jesus paid the penalty. He died on the cross so we could be dead to sin. The good news is that in dying to sin, we become alive to something else. And that's going to be the focus of the message next week. That we become alive to God. And that's what we're going to celebrate right now when we go to the Lord's table. That's what we're going to celebrate. So, as we go to the Lord's table, let's really put this scripture that we just studied in the front of our minds. Think about that idea of being dead to sin, burying your sin and being raised with Christ. So, Examine ourselves to see if we're living as though we are dead to sin. Or are we reveling in the good old days? Am I? Are you reveling in the good old days? Do you still have that highlight reel in your mind? 
or are you secretly holding on to some of those sins and those times are precious to you? I want to read this scripture that's, usually I read the part right before it when we take communion, but I want to read this part because just as I was putting this together, it seemed very appropriate. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 33 says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. And then this verse 33 says, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. So Paul is writing that in context. I want you to hear this. He's writing that in context to this Corinthian church that was just going crazy. Like people are getting stopped with the Lord's table. And then other people have nothing. Right? And then some people are like, hey, if a little splash of wine is good to celebrate the blood, then a whole bottle is better. Right? And so people are getting drunk at the at the Lord's table, right? So there's crazy stuff going on. And Paul is saying, Whoa, what are you doing? This is not right. And right before this, he gives those instructions about the bread and the cup and praying for them and blessing them. But what I, what I looked at today, there's two principles that I want us to take. That we're called to spend some time examining ourselves. Right? We're called to spend some time examining ourselves. And the other one that I love, and we don't do it often, but is this idea of waiting for one another. And so we're going to do things a little bit different than what we've done in the past months. We're going to come up. LaDonna's going to play some music. We're going to come up and get our elements just like normal, so it'll be one stack of two cups bread in the bottom cup, juice in the top cup. Come up and grab them. Go back to your seats and just hold them. And then Leonard is going to come up and lead us through the actual taking of the elements, okay? So it's just going to look a little bit different, but I just want this idea, us as a family, I want this picture, I want you to have this picture. Us as a family, being dead to sin, burying sin, being raised in Christ, and coming to his table together, to celebrate what he did on the cross. That he gave us the ability to even do this. To even be dead to sin. Through his death. And if you're not a member of New Hope, that's okay. You don't need to be. But you need to be a member of the body of Christ. And if you're not a member of the body of Christ, that's okay. Because you can do that too. Right? You look at all this, and you look in this time of self-examination, maybe as I've been talking, you've been saying, I am not okay. I am not dead to sin. And if that's the case, you make this, this choice to say, I'm not dead to sin, and I want to be dead to sin. And I can't be dead to sin on my own. But I can be because Jesus paid the penalty. And so you take your faith and your trust, and you place it in him. And when that happens, you receive that grace of God that saves. And it's that grace that saves and nothing else. It's not grace plus anything. So you accept that gift. You move from this place of death to life. You move from this place of punishment to blessing. And then you partake of these elements to celebrate that. So we're going to do this going to be just a little bit different. Take some time while LaDonna's playing. When you're ready, come up, take your elements, take them back to your seat, and then Leonard's going to lead us through this. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the finished work of Christ on the cross that gives us the ability to be dead to sin. God, without that, we are unable to be dead to sin. So God, as we proclaim your death until your return, as Scripture tells us, I pray that you would bless our humble efforts here with this bread and this juice, that you would help them 
to become a symbol for us of your body given up for us and your blood poured out for us, for our salvation, for our ability to be put in right standing with you, and that there's nothing that we can do other than to just accept that gift, and that we can find rest in that. God, that we can get off of the wheel that we've been running on, and we can just find rest in you. So God, I pray that you would be with us in this time of reflection, that you would bring to light things that need to be made right, Lord, and that if there's things that need to be made right that would stop us from partaking today, that we would just not partake today. But God, that in that time of self-reflection, Lord, that we can come to this place where we're able to take the bread and the juice and we're able to celebrate what you did for us, God, that you would meet us here. And Lord, bless us as we wait for one another and take this as a family today. In Jesus' name.